welcome everyone on this hot, steamy morning. Um, do we have any announcements? Any birthdays? Anniversaries? Okay. Um, Esther Belmont will be having surgery next Thursday on the 30th in Kearney. And Virginia's niece, Anita, Anita uh, is in Mayo for her treatments on her cancer. And uh, Norris was telling us that Gary Maydew and his wife are in the assisted living in Ames, Iowa. And they're still along pretty good. Anyone else? Any other concerns do we have? Uh, how's Charlotte and Norman getting along in the nursing home? Uh, all right. Good. Joy. Well, Joy, the last three days, Corey's youngest boy is an auntie's girlfriend. Oh, she's in age. And uh, so, anyway, we had a lot of fun. Good. Doesn't seem like his children should be old enough to have girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess that's a sign I'm getting old. <laughs> okay, we're going to uh, do the centering words. If anything is excellent, if anything is admirable, if any course of action is holy and pure, righteous and true, focus your mind on those things and God will bring you peace. Now, if you will open your hymnal to 377, it is well with my soul, and we will sing verses 1 and 2. Give 
blessings, both spiritual and physical. Help us to hold lightly the fading things of this earth and grasp tightly the lasting things of your kingdom, so that what we are and do and say may be our gifts to you through Christ, who beckons all to seek the things above, where he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. We pray to you, our God and community, holy in one. Amen. like to offer this morning before we get started with the rest of our service. If not, then if you would pray with me, we were going, we're going to pray a prayer of illumination so that God will enter our hearts as we listen to his word today. Let us pray. Your, God, your word, O oh God, is a feast all its own. Let your Holy Spirit open our minds to your call to listen. For we know your holy word heals and reconciles people. Amen. All right. Well, today we are on the last of our sermons for this series on living in uncertain times. And today we are looking at Paul. And through his writings from prison, he was facing a pretty uncertain future. Paul calls on the Philippians in the letter that we're going to read today to rejoice and to give thanks to God no matter what their circumstances are in life. God's peace is with us and binds our hearts and our minds together in Jesus Christ, especially when things around us are not so peaceful. And so listen now to the words of Paul as he's writing to the Philippians in chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. A short little piece but very full of information and advice for all of us. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, today, like I said, is the last sermon in our Living in Uncertain Times series, and we've been exploring characters in the Bible who lived during some uncertain times as well. And if you'll remember back about five weeks ago, we started with looking at Job, and we looked at how Job chose faith amid his suffering and how we can do the same. And then the next week we looked at Daniel and we learned that in both times of prosperity and in times of persecution that we can trust and hope in Christ. And then we looked at Abraham on the third week and we looked at his covenant with God. And we learned that God's covenant, through that covenant, we can believe and trust in God's promises even in the worst of times. And then last week, we talked about the disciples. We talked about the disciples and, and Christ's expectation for them and how we, too, need to let our expectations be shaped by Christ rather than to be of our own desires. Now, today, we're going to look at the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul, he went through a tremendous hardship in his ministry as he was preaching the word of Christ around the world. However, he was, had found the secret to contentment and to peace, no matter what the circumstances were in his life. And he went through some pretty tough times. Even in the worst of seasons, Paul found that we, we can learn how to be content in Christ and not necessarily worry about our circumstances. Now, can anybody give me a good definition of contempt? Anybody want to try defining contempt? Contempt, it means the act of despising. Okay, so remember that, the act of despising. How about contentment? Anybody got a good, uh, a good definition for that? It's satis the dictionary defines it as to be satisfied or to feel or show satisfaction with one's possession, status, or situation. So think about it, despising or being satisfied, okay? Two words to kind of think about the opposite here. Now, when it comes to our lives, 
Though that's the choice that we get to make in life. We can either despise our lives or we can be satisfied with what happens in our lives. And, and we can despise the situations that we get into, especially when it's a negative circumstance or something bad happens. Uh, and we, and we can have this lack of contentment or we can be content with whatever it is that happens with the possessions we have, with the status we have, with the situation we find ourselves in, regardless of how that, what kind of situation it is. And Paul is telling us today how we do that. Paul writes about this peace and contentment when he writes to the church of Philippi. Here he is, he's in prison, okay? He's in prison and he's writing to the church of Philippi about how to be content. And he says to them, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned how to be content, whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and all circumstances, whether I'm well fed or I'm hungry, whether I have plenty or whether I have nothing. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Now, of course, he's talking about Christ and having Christ with him wherever he goes and whatever the circumstance. Paul was an apostle of the early church and wrote a lot of the New Testament that we read, all of his letters, a lot of those letters from prison. Paul was not one of the original 12 apostles, but he was later converted in faith to Jesus through uh, the Messiah after he had a dark history of killing off Christians. He really despised Christ. He didn't like him very much and thought he was an illegitimate sect, that he had begun an illegitimate sect. And so he went around persecuting and killing off the Christians. But then Christ came along and converted him. And if you haven't read his conversion story, you should, because it's quite the drama and quite a dramatic way of being converted. But Paul, if we know about Paul, Saul, when he, before he was converted, he was an educated man. He had gone to school and he was educated in, in the ways of the Jewish people. He was a Pharisee. He had belonged to the strong, strictest of the, the religious sects there and was, was a, a Pharisee there for them. He was a Roman citizen. He had been born into a family who had Roman citizenship. And he went and throughout his ministry, after he was converted, he went through tremendous hardship and struggle in order to minister to and, and share the gospel with the people. And ultimately, he was martyred at the end of his life. Paul wrote a majority, as I said, of, his, of this New Testament from prison, and he, he, he had nothing. He was locked in a prison cell and was facing a death sentence for his preaching of the gospel and all of that because he chose to remain true to Christ after his conversion. To tell the good news, to spread the word throughout the world and to all the people everywhere and he was betrayed during that time by fellow believers and by false teachers. He was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was shackled. There were lots of things that happened to him. And while all of this was going on, what was Paul preaching to the people? Paul was preaching them to the, the, to the church to love others. He was preaching to the, to the people to respect the government. He was preaching to the people to grow in the fruits of the Spirit. And Paul was also talking about his own issues with the thorn in his flesh. But despite that thorn, he continued to preach and, and to reach out to others with the gospel of Christ. Paul could have despised his circumstances. He could have compromised his faith. But he chose to believe that in each situation, the joy of Christ in his heart would bring him contentment. And thus <clears throat> Paul stressed to the faithful people, his faithful supporters in the ministry, that one thing of all else had he learned. And in and through it all, that this was the one thing he wanted them to remember and to live by for the rest of their Christian journey. And that, that was his discovery of the secret of contentment. And so here he shows that he shares with us the true story of contentment. True contentment, he tells us, is found not in things, it's not found in, in other people, it's not found in our situation, 
but it's found in Christ. It's found in Christ. And despite his circumstances, Paul was content because he had Jesus in his heart and in his mind. No matter what was going on, he always had Jesus there with him. Paul could have despised his circumstances, but he didn't. And, and there were two ways that we can become, uh, uh, that we can approach our circumstances in our lives. One of them can be to, to have contempt for our lives, to despise what's going on in our lives. Or the other is that we can follow what Paul tells us and we can be content with our lives. We can be people who are content, not in our circumstances, but in the God that we know and that we love. Our faith, our hope, our promises, our salvation, that contentment, it doesn't come from within us. It doesn't come from other people around us or from the situations that we find ourselves in, but it comes from a personal relationship with God in our lives, the God who created and loves us. It comes from that relationship that we build with God, our, our Father. Or the other way we can approach our lives is we can worry, we can fret, we can think negatively, we can sit on our pity pot, and we can expect the worst in life. And so we have to wonder, how is it that we do react to the circumstances of our lives? Think about it. How do you react when something happens in your life? How do you react to the circumstances, especially if they're hard circumstances? There once was a, a, a Jewish man who came to his rabbi and he was complaining to the rabbi, life is so unbearable, rabbi. We, I just can't take it. it. It's unbearable for me and my family. There are nine of us and we all live in one room. What can we do? It's just unbearable. And so the rabbi turned to the man and he says, bring your goat indoors. And the guy's looking at the rabbi like, what are you talking about? The rabbi says, just do what I'm telling you. Bring your goat indoors and come back in a week. And so he goes home and he brings the goat into the, into the house. And a week later, he comes back to the rabbi and he says, that goat is filthy. We just can't take it anymore. That goat is just horrible. And the rabbi says, well, let the goat out and come back in a week. So the man goes home and he lets the goat out and he comes back in a week and he's so excited and he's so joyful and he turns to the rabbi and he says, life is beautiful, rabbi. We enjoy our lives now. There's no filthy goat. It's just the nine of us together. That's how we can be with our lives too. In practically every one of life's situations, things could be worse than they seem. Now, th that's where we get that, that old statement, always look for the silver lining. How many of us truly, though, look for the silver lining in whatever is going on? We can despise our lives, or we can look for that silver lining, for that good amongst the negative things that are happening. We can make the necessary adjustments, and we can proceed in, in the circumstances. Now, for nine-year-old Ezra Fretch, his struggles were very real. Even though he had only lived a very short time here at nine, due to his congenital abnormality, he was born with a dramatically curved left leg and one of his, uh, only one finger on his left hand. And the doctors had to amputate that left leg because of, uh, of the abnormality when he was about 11 months old. And so they amputated it and replaced it with a prosthetic limb. And then they, had to, they took the, the big toe off of this foot that they amputated and, and they put it on his left hand to serve as a thumb for him so he would have partial functionality of his hand. Now Ezra says that sometimes it can be difficult for him and he can feel different when, when other kids are staring or whispering about him. But he also knows that he can do just the same kinds of things as other kids around him if he tries hard enough. One thing Ezra loves is to play sports, and Ezra plays all kinds of sports. He plays soccer and football and, and basketball, and he likes to run track. And whenever he's playing sports, his mind is always focused on the game, and he feels just like every other kid on the, on the field. Now, we can face our problems, and we can respond to them in, in a more positive way, or we can panic and, be, and become bitter and have self-pity and the like. 
We can choose to rise above the untenable and the unwanted circumstances of our lives and be content when we face adversity. Yes, we can do any of those. And we can handle all of that and all things through Christ who strengthens each and every one of us. Now, Paul, he was there in prison. He was chained to, to a Roman soldier. He was living in tiny quarters. He was eating a, a meager diet. And nevertheless, he confirmed that he was content in his circumstances, in spite of what those circumstances were. And we can rise above our circumstances as well, much like the old mule that fell into the well. And I don't know how many of you have heard this, this story, but listen to it. Once there was a farmer who owned an old mule, and then one day the mule fell down into the well. And the mule started braying or praying or whatever it is mules do when they fall into a well. And so he, the farmer went out and he assessed the situation and he looked at the well and he was looking to see what was going on. And he decided that neither the mule nor the well were worth saving. And so he went over to his neighbors and he recruited them all to come over and help him to fill in the well with dirt. And so they started to throw dirt in. They hauled in the dirt and started to bury the old mule to put him out of his misery. Now, initially, the old mule was just hysterical. Here they were throwing dirt into the well, but as the farmer and his neighbors continued to shovel the dirt and the dirt would hit his back, the mule would start to shake it off and step up. This he did blow after blow. Shake it off and step up. Shake it off and step up. Shake it off and step up. No matter how painful the blows were to the mule, or how distressing the situation was for him, the old mule fought the panic and he kept right on shaking it off and stepping up. And it wasn't long before that old mule stepped over the edge of that well and in his exhausted state triumphantly. What seemed like it was going to bury him all because, it helped him all because of the way he handled that adversity. We too, can change the way we look at the adversity that, with which we are faced. In this text, Paul is saying to us and to the Philippians that in every circumstance in which he found himself, whether he was facing plenty or whether he was hungry, whether he had abundance or was in need, he could find that he was divinely strengthened to do anything and everything that God called him to do through Christ. Paul was convinced that he, as he goes through about his ministry, that Christ would give him the strength to complete anything that he was called to do. This verse is about having the strength to be content when we're facing those moments in life when physical resources are minimal. And this is about having faith in a God, the God who's sovereignly in control of everything in this world, of all circumstances in life. The God who sees and knows our needs and promises to meet them through Christ. True contentment comes only through this God who enables believers to be satisfied and to eat and have the ease of peace amid any problem there is. Paul was content because he knew that no matter what happened to him, that Christ was there with him. And true contentment comes when we realize that Christ is here with us, dwelling in us. We, we know that bad things happen in the world. Bad things happen. Stuff drags us down. Stuff comes along that's negative. But Jesus told us this in the, in, in the Bible, in John 16. He says, I've said these things to you so that you will have peace in me. In the world, you will have distress. But be encouraged. I have conquered the world. You see, you and I, we have limited control over what happens in our world and in our circumstances, which come, the, the circumstances that come our way. We can never be sure uh, uh, what the next few months or the next year is going to bring to our homes, to our families, to our lives. But in all the storms of life, we can hear the voice of Jesus as he dwells in us, saying to us, be encouraged. I'm here with you. And I love you. When writing to his young disciple Timothy, Paul instructs Timothy this way. He says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. 
For we brought nothing into the world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kind of evil, for which some have strayed from their faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You see, John Piper, he has a statement that, that tells us this. It's a well-known statement. It goes like this. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Let me say that one more time. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. You see, that's the, the, the definition of contentment. When we're satisfied with the God who dwells within us, no matter what circumstances we are in, true contentment is neither found in nor contingent upon the circumstances of life, but upon our faith in Christ who dwells in us. Despite our circumstances, we can still be content when we have Jesus in our hearts and in our minds. So may we find such contentment in the situations of our life and find satisfaction in Christ. And in so doing, may we discover true and lasting contentment, whatever may come our way. Amen? Amen. All right. So here's what I want you to ponder for this week. I want you to think about over the last year when, about a time when you were truly content. What was going on that you were truly content in that situation? How did the feeling of contentment impact your attitude and your relationships? How did contentment impact your relationships and your attitude? What would contentment look like in various areas of your life? The relate your relationship with God or your relationship with your finances or with other people or with work? What would that look like? And in what ways have you experienced God providing for you in those times of need? What area of life is it that you need that you see the biggest need for finding that contentment this year? We're in a year of uncertainty. We've got a lot of stuff going on. So where is it that we need to look and what, how do we need to get, you know, move towards uh, finding Christ in that area that we are the least content? How do you plan on making that happen for this year? So kind of some things to think about. All right. Well, as we prepare for prayer, we're going to be singing uh, page 351, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. And we are going to uh, sing verse 2 of that. Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, 351. Verse 2.
today, Lord, we come to you and we pray for the world leaders that they may always seek the peace and security of this world. We pray for countries laid waste to by war and conflict and dictatorships, remembering especially the plight of the people in those places. We pray for the police and the emergency service workers as they seek peace and security for our nations and for ordinary people who got, get caught up in the events of world politics. We pray for the worldwide church as we recognize our fellowship with Christians everywhere in the world, Lord, whether it be in Africa or Asia or Europe or throughout the developing world. We ask your blessing upon ministers and missionaries, medical workers and aid agencies, all who are tasked to feed the hungry, heal the sick, and support the brokenhearted. Lord, we pray for your church here in Lebanon and for those that are thriving and those that have lost a sense of direction. We give thanks for our own church here and all the people that are within it, and we gladly acknowledge all the gifts that you have given to each and every one of us. Grant us your help, your guidance, your support. Today, O oh Lord, we remember in our prayers those who are worried about their health and what the future might hold. We pray for those who are feeling anxious or depressed or afraid. We pray for those who are in hospitals and those whose burdens they find impossible to share. We pray for those who are still mourning the loss of dear ones to their hearts. Gracious God, we too have problems and needs and concerns and worries about ourselves and our families and those we love. And so we pray for ourselves as well that we might know how the gentle authority of Jesus in all parts of our lives would lead us and guide us and encourage and direct us now and always. God of amazing grace, there are others we know and love who are ill and hurting. And so we ask that you, O oh God, would surround them with your strong healing presence as we pray especially for Esther as she is coming up on this surgery, Lord, and for Joe as he cares for her, for the doctors who will perform the surgery, Lord, we pray for each and every one of them. For Anita as she receives treatment, and for the doctors who are giving those treatments, for the nurses who are caring for her, for Gary and his wife in assisted living, and for Charlotte and Norman in the nursing home. And we, we are, give you thanks, Lord, that Mike is doing so well and getting ready to receive his prosthetics. And we're thankful for Corey's youngest and his girlfriend who are visiting and sharing their love with their great-grandparents. Lord, we love our families. We love the people of this world, or we try to, Lord. And we ask that you be with us and that you care for each and every one of us as we pray for the people of Florida and Texas and uh, Arizona and California, all dealing with the increasing numbers of COVID-19 and the deaths. We pray for the people of Texas as they deal with the hurricane that has come through and flooded Corpus Christi. We pray for Hawaii and the Hawaiian Islands as, as the tropical storm flows by them this day and so many other things, Lord, that are going on, so many that we cannot even begin to mention them all. And so, listening, God, we ask that you hear now our prayers, all of our prayers, as we offer to you the prayers of our heart in this time of silence.
gracious God, pour out your spirit upon us. Fix our hearts and our minds on what is true and honorable and right. Give us the joy and the peace that comes from knowing and doing your will. And keep us faithful to the call we have received in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Extending your loving invitation to the world around us. We pray all this in the name of the one who showed us the depth of his passion for your kingdom. Who taught us to live in love and justice. And in whose life, death, and resurrection we find the path to kingdom living. Our Redeemer and our Lord Jesus Christ. Who taught his friends to pray as one family. By saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Today our closing hymn is 128, He Leadeth Me, O Blessed Thought, and we're going to sing verses 1 and 3. Again, that's 128, He Leadeth Me, O Blessed Thought.